Hello, pod dear friends. My name is Xavier, and you're watching Oh God Guide Me. Today, we are joined by Mr. Steve Sorowitz. Hello, Steve. Hi, Xavier. Hello, Pa. Hello, nice to pa. talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too. And today, he's going to be telling us about his uh, journey in finding the faith uh, and the teachings of Baha'u'llah and how they changed his life. So first, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? And where are you? I am in Highland Park, Illinois. I'm in my third floor office. You can tell by the garden behind me, which <laughs> is actually not in Highland Park, Illinois. That's Akko, Israel. That's the shrine of Baha'u'llah. To those of you who don't know, the uh, holiest place in the world for Baha'is uh, and a place that changed my life. But that's a, a little story for later. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur um, and, I'm in a, and I'm a philanthropist and, and I think I'm a full time Baha'i, if that's possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's possible. Um, uh, Mr. Sarowitz dedicates much of his life uh, to spreading the teachings of Baha'u'llah. So uh, when did you first hear about these teachings? Uh, how old are you, Xavier? Uh, I am 26. Okay, you look young. So I was younger than you. I was like 19 or 20. I was in college at Hillel, the Jewish Student Center. I was raised Jewish. And I heard about this thing called progressive revelation. A gentleman came in and told us about progressive revelation. I love that concept right from the start. And for many, many years after that, I said, well, I'm Jewish, but I like what the Baha'is have to say. Yeah, well, that's great. That, uh, so you were raised Jewish, and then you uh, heard about uh, someone just talking about the Baha'i faith, or one of the aspects of it, one, one of the many aspects of progressive revelation. Well, I love the idea that instead of me being right as a Jew, and the Christians being wrong, or the Christians being right, and the Jews being wrong, and, or the Muslims being right and the you know, there's always, there's so many people, oh, yeah. you know, somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. I love the idea that everybody was right. And that was the biggest thing that I loved is that all religions could be right. And it just made sense. Progressive revelation. I mean, the whole way we're taught by a lot of different religions, you know, for example, in Christianity, a lot of Christians think that God never, never sent a prophet, never sent anybody, you know, a couple nice people like Moses, but then Jesus and then nothing else. And that doesn't make sense if God loves us. Or as I was raised as a Jew, the last prophet was 3,500 years ago with Moses. And mm -hmm. God loves us, right? And who are these Muslims and Christians? And what do they believe? And I, and I really didn't have any answers. Of course, I didn't even have questions for most of my life or you know, when I was younger. Because I just did like most people did. I followed the religion of my parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, that importance on the individual finding of the independent investigation of truth is so important in the Baha'i faith. And it's so important because a lot of the times we'll just do what our parents did. And that doesn't cause true societal growth um, that's needed. Yes, that, that's changing. So student, so um, children are now moving away from their parents' faith. But mostly, if you look at the world today, most people do one of two things. They either stay in the faith of their parents or they leave the faith of their parents. But they never consider that if there's anything else outside of those two alternatives, which essentially, if you've chosen not to be the religion of your parents, you still haven't made a choice. You've just made a, a slight adjustment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's, as you said, it's one way or the other. Generally, they don't switch faiths or if they do, it's sort of, uh, you know, oh, I'm, I was raised this, but I do this, but I don't really practice or well, what have you generally, especially people my age, you know, I'm 26. Mm -hmm not a great time to be religious a lot of life changes and especially younger than me also um, that'll change i mean you're, you're going to notice a huge change after this year the coronavirus is waking people up oh, in a yeah. way that I've never seen in my life oh. and it should because we need to be woken up i mean god is the centerpiece he's our creator he's the center of all our lives he's the reason for all our lives he god is everything you know the messengers you know kind of goes in a hierarchy God is infinite. The messengers are, are close to infinite. And then way, way, way down, this little grain of sand that's, that's me or you. And, yet, and yet so many people today think the grain of sand is important and ignores the infinite. It's, uh, it's almost unfathom, unfathomable that we would live a life like that. And it's a sad life because you're limited to the grain of sand and your, your world becomes very small and, and not joyful. Because there's no, there's no joy without God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that importance on um, the 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 coronavirus 
really bringing out that how really interconnected the entire world is absolutely yeah. obvious now you know before we could say you know well this place was affected by a hurricane or these people had a drought or you know the hunger's over here but now it's everybody's been affected by this in one way or another from the very rich the very poor um everybody has been hit by it and it shows that interconnected oneness of all humanity that baha'u'llah teaches about that all the religions have truly teach, taught about but that now is incredibly inherent among society in its nature as of today yes and, and what i say always to young people like you not necessarily you because you're already there but we have to eat we have to eat both materially and spiritually and if i were to starve myself and i wouldn't eat materially and someone put a bag of cheetos or something really bad right in front of me i'd be eating the cheetos because that's you know i'd be really hungry we do that spiritually. Um, so many of us, so many people in your generation in particular, are starved. They're literally starving themselves spiritually and don't realize it. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, oh, I'm not really religious. I'm religious. I'm spiritual. Well, there is no spirituality without religion, but people don't know that. I mean, you can have a, uh, it's, you can have a little bit. It's almost like leftovers, crumbs. There's crumbs of spirituality, but the true spirituality is to be found in true religion. It's the home of spirituality. And so um, anything that's left over, you know, like you have these um, practices like meditation. But by the way, meditation is wonderful. I'm not saying it's part of religion, but it's only a part. And so you get these little fragments of religion and people think that's the whole thing. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. You, it's not. You're picking at the crumbs and you're missing the delicious cake in the corner. <laughs> and, and that's. Yeah. And that, because you don't know the cake is there. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, so think of it like spiritually, you know, I've starved myself spiritually. I haven't prayed. I haven't meditated. I haven't, I haven't read the word of God. And so now someone comes along with a video game. Someone comes along with drugs. Someone comes along with alcohol. Do you know people in your age group, cirrhosis of the liver among uh, young people is up 66% the last 15 years? Oof, it's not a surprise. Everyone I know drinks. <laughs> yeah, most of the people, so, most of my friends drink. Um, yes, but it's you know, it's there's there's no as you know, I mean, you were raised a Baha'i. There's really no purpose to drinking. I've I've been a non-drinker pretty much my whole life. I only drank for six months, and I've never missed it. And you know, I, what I notice is when I go to a Baha'i event and nobody's drinking, people are very joyous. And yeah. frankly, the nice thing is we don't have hangovers the next day. <laughs> yeah, Baha'is, we definitely don't uh, you know, don't get that problem. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of problems we don't have. I, frankly, Baha'is are unusually joyful during the COVID. I mean, I unusually optimistic. I think that people are starting to notice that the Baha'is are a little different. Yeah. They might think we're a little strange and a little insane, but we're actually sane. And that's really, so if, if you want to go through my journey, I was a Reformed Jew, no idea what the Baha'i faith was. I, when I'm about 20, I hear about it. Now, of course, I got right on it, and I became a Baha'i only 29 years later. <laughs> that was quick, yeah. And of course, I teach the faith nonstop now, and I expect people to become Baha'is in 14, 15 seconds instead of my 29 years. But yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the reason it took me so long is a couple of reasons. Number one, I was in college, and you know, I had other priorities outside of becoming spiritual. I mean, girls. Uh, I don't know if I had a second or third priority, but that was my first priority. Yeah, of course. Um, but the. Um, and I like to play sports, you know, just typical things a young 20 year old boy wanted to do. And then I got involved in business and, and my career. Um, I eventually uh, started dating a young lady who I married. And as we started dating, this is about five years later, she asked me, um, how do you want to raise the kids if we have kids? And I said, um, Baha'i. She was Catholic and I was Jewish. And she <laughs> said, no, 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 a real religion. <laughs> so I said, okay, well then Jewish. So years later, we married more years after that, we have kids. And I still haven't even studied the Bible faith. I actually studied Christianity from the time I was in my mid 20s till actually today, I still study it almost 30 years later. A friend of mine asked me to study Christianity. And after a few months, my, my parents had taught me that we don't believe in Jesus. That was my big belief. I had no idea what that meant. And I never really, again, not questioning. I never even questioned what that meant. I was a Jew. I didn't believe in Jesus. That was uh -huh. that's the That's the status. <laughs> and after a few months of reading of the word of Jesus, I started saying, well, my God, this is beautiful. It's not just beautiful. It's unspeakably beautiful. It's wonderful. 
why don't I believe in it? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just couldn't figure out why I didn't believe in Jesus after that. I just didn't understand. And so I never actually became a Christian. Eventually, now getting into my 40s, I started studying the Baha'i faith. I had another friend who asked me to study the Baha'i faith to do what we call Rui. Mm -hmm. And a few years later in Rui 4, I had an epiphany uh, that Baha'u'llah was that's who he said he was. And so I ran home to my wife and I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And she said, no, you're not. You have to wait till after the bar mitzvah. <laughs> and so I was waiting till after the bar mitzvah. And meanwhile, I had a company. The company went public. Mm -hmm. uh, it is public, Paylocity. We did very well. And I started doing philanthropy. And I called up a gentleman by the name of Bill Strickland. And I said, Bill, um, I'd like to build this center on the west side of Chicago, which, which we did. And then he said, our fifth conversation, he says, uh, I'd like uh, talking to these Jewish philanthropists and we want to center in Akko, Israel for Jews and Arabs. And I about fell out of my chair. I'm like, Akko, Israel? Are you kidding me, Bill? Uh, he had no idea why I was so excited. And I had to explain <laughs> to him about the Baha'i faith and that Akko is the holiest place in the world. And of course, the you know Baji and the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, which we're looking at behind me. Mm -hmm. And I walked into that garden one person and I walked out another person. I had a complete spiritual transformation and just instantly. And I, what I saw was that we were in a new age, that it was the age of world peace and that Baha'u'llah had brought it. He had brought it. He had changed the equilibrium of the whole world. And I, and I hadn't even read that yet in the Baha'i writings. I just saw it. And I was sure of it. And I rushed out to tell everybody for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still... Still telling everybody, I'm still, you know, proclaiming the Baha'i faith, but at least sometimes I say hello first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I guess. But I, re I really, I think I've been called by, I mean, just, I understand, you know, people don't understand why I'm so excited, but, you know, in times like this and the coronavirus, Baha'is are hopeful. We know how it ends. We know, yeah. we know we're going to be okay. We know what this, this is one of the calamities that God is sending to us. And we know that, that God exists and that he loves us. I mean, we, we, if you don't have a religion, if you don't have a path, a lot of times the spirituality is not there. And so it's, you know, you have a lot of fear, you have a lot of anxiety. And I see a lot less of that among Baha'is. We're not perfect. We have things that bother us. But what happens is we tend to, you know, even if you push us down, we tend to bob back up to the surface. And that's kind of how my personality is. So you, you ask, how did the Baha'i faith change me? I'm happier. Like a thousand. I mean, I wasn't unhappy before. I'm just kind of giddy happy most days. And people, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I went to the grocery store the other day, smiling and being, and people were like, "What the hell? It's a, it, don't you know? It's a, it, it's a pandemic. You're supposed to be upset." I'm, I'm like, "No, I love you. I love you today, tomorrow. I'm six feet away. Don't worry. Yeah, I love you six feet away." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or five feet apart. You know, of course, I, I'm also in the movie business now, so I changed my life that way. I, uh, the wonderful Justin Baldoni is oh, my yeah. business partner at Wayfair, and uh, he made a movie called Five Feet Apart last year. So. I think that's kind of ironic, but t typically, you know, for a Baha'i, he was a year ahead of his time. Yeah, and, and I definitely suggest uh, people check that out. It's a wonderful movie um, when it's available Absolutely. and if it's available in your area. I, I also ended up making a movie called The Gate. Uh-huh, I saw you work on The Gate. Wonderful film. Uh, one of my absolute favorites. A wonderful, if you're in, curious, wonderful introduction to the faith. It really is about, um, um, about the the Bob, who was the forerunner to Baha'u'llah, the, the revelation bringer. Uh, the gate is what the Bob translates to. So that's what it's he acted as. We're talking about the gate. There's the shrine of the Bob behind mm -hmm. me. The shrine of the Bob on the 19 terraces of gardens in Haifa, Israel. Beautiful place. I personally have not seen it yet. I've never been on pilgrimage uh, as of yet, but we'll get there one day. <laughs> May you have a blessed pilgrimage when that happens. Oh, thank you. Now that we've heard your wonderful story about how you found the faith um, and some of the changes that came into your life, you know, the, the happiness that it brought and the, the contentment, really, the, the absolute joy uh, that you seem to have, um, what struggles came along with that? It was a little tough for my wife and my best friend at the time to uh, deal with the new me. Uh, I was, you know, I was here and all of a sudden I was here instantly. And that's tough. And I actually found out, I read about it later, people have spiritual transformations and people have life after death experiences, they're very similar, tend to get divorced. And I came pretty close. I mean, wife and I, wow. struggled. Um, we made it through, uh, but it was touch and go. I mean, there was a point where I was pretty sure I was gonna get divorced. And 
my wife was pretty sure. In fact, uh, she was she had enough of me. And I think, uh, you know, it wasn't that I, I've never been a mean person, but you know, she it's pretty hard to go from somebody who's a business person to someone who just loves Baha'u'llah. And that's all they can talk about for a year or two. Mm-hmm. I still talk about Baha'u'llah a lot, but now you can actually get me to have a conversation about something else if you if you prod me. Time. Well, that's congratulations. I'm so happy you guys were able to hold that together and and keep that unity uh, amongst your the two of you. That's great. And then uh, I had uh, some struggles with one of my nonprofits, and I learned by heart, oh friend, in the garden of thy heart, plant not but the rose of love. And from the nightingale of affection and desire, loosen not thy hold. Treasure the companionship of the righteous. And eschew all fellowship with the ungodly. I've, I've memorized a few of the writings. I've memorized the first 71 hidden words in the Tablet of Ahmad so far. And of course, that's the Persian hidden words. I have a few of those as well. That's quite an I'm accomplishment. <laughs> that's my memorization uh, repertoire. I am... Um, I, you know, I always could do better. I've seen Baha'is who can do better. I, I just, I just love the writings, and that way I have them with me. I don't have to have a prayer book with me. I have, you know, I also have the healing prayer and re- remover of difficulties. Just to have a few. I, I know there's, like I said, I could still do better. I could always do more. Mm. Well, it's still wonderful, and that that you've done that, and then it's gone so well for you after discovering Baha'u'llah. Even though those, you know, it got rocky there for a little bit, you were able to, to really pull through that and essentially trust in God. I have complete trust in Baha'u'llah, complete trust in God, less trust in myself. So I, I pray every day and I literally get down on my hands and knees every morning and ask for God's will. And, you know, I've met so many wonderful people along the way. And, and you know, you don't always get everything you ask for. You don't always get your dreams. But mm-hmm. I have what Baha'u'llah has given me. I'm thankful for that. And so I think that, you know, I think that we're so lucky just that he came. And so I try to share it. And I, and I have met so many amazing, beautiful people along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, people wonder, like, well, how do, you, how do you talk about your religion so much or why? And it's like, well, when you have a loved one, a child or a wife or a husband or something, you want to speak about them as much as you can. And uh, Baha'u'llah is no different. Baha'is love Baha'u'llah and Christ and Muhammad and Abraham and Moses, and we love them with all our hearts. And so that's what we want to talk about. And we want you, we want to teach you so that you, uh, so that other people feel that love as well. Uh, On Twitter right now, at number seven, they're, um, they have a tweet about the coming Mahdi, and people are saying how he's going to come and save the world. Mm-hmm. And it's really shameful that, of course, looking right behind me, there is the, there is the shrine of the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, and it's been so suppressed. I believe that over the next couple of years, it's going to come out that he came. You know, of course, it's not like it, Baha'is haven't made it public, but I think people are going to start listening. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be mass conversions to the faith. Because I, I think that people are going to start realizing, you know, because they want it so badly. Now that they want it, we want the Mahdi, we want the Mahdi. Okay, you want him, he's here. You know, it happened with the Bab. There was mass conversions. And think about how hard they had to fight that. There was 100,000 followers of the Bab. And that was with them jailing him in the most remote jail, and he still got a hundred thousand followers. Imagine now we let that that genie out of the bottle. And my movie, by the way, I put it in Farsi and put it out for free in Farsi. It's still out there for free in Farsi. You know, you know what the Iranian government did? They made their own version of it in Farsi. They took my movie, our movie, they took scenes from our movie, took the whole movie, and they cut it up and they replaced our experts with their, I'll call them what it, experts. Ah. lies about the Bob, which they've been telling for 175 years. To me, I almost think to myself some days, I think, you know, why bother? You, you know, why bother fighting God? And literally, I mean, I know. It's like I trying to push back the tide. <laughs> I think it'd be a lot easier to push back the tide. God's much stronger <laughs> than the tide. I just don't get it. I don't even get it why they try. I'm like, and, you know, it's interesting if you watch the Bob right now. God seems to be a little unhappy. They have the corona. We all have the coronavirus. But they have not only on top of that, they have locusts, they have sinkholes, they have droughts, they have earthquakes, they have floods. They have the greatest military in the history of the world that is poised to attack them if they kind of go one more step out of line. And they have economic reform. Yeah. And they and have people who don't learn. 
them in their own country that they've had to kill. Oh yeah, and it's and it's so unfortunate. You know, we want the Iranian government to do well, and we, we want do. we do we want the Iranian government to do well. We want them to be supported by the people, and we want yeah. the people to love their government and embrace them. We want nothing but grace and beauty and kindness and love for the Iranians. Absolutely, and every country is Baha'is, mm -hmm. and and you know, I've tried to explain this to people that no, I don't hate the Ayatollah or anybody. I want them to be good and kind, and I wish they would not do what they do. I wish that the Ayatollah would love the Baha'is and stop killing them and persecuting them. I wish the Ayatollah would, would start loving his own people, but he hasn't shown a predilection towards doing that. And I would hope that he would, number one, that he would change. That mm -hmm. would be my greatest hope, that he would change and change into the ruler that he, that, you know, if we want to support our government. And so we, we'd want that government to be good. It hasn't shown in the last 175 years for the most part, much skill but uh yes we want we want the best for the iranian people yeah. you know in any way i think what's going to happen is this beautiful absolutely stunning shrine which really represents the teachings of the bob which are also equally stunning will be free and i think something that's telling me that as well as you've got the shrine of abdul baha being built and all the people in akko are really excited about it and so What's happening is the Baha'i faith is coming out of the shadows. And I just, I think, I'm a little older than you. I'm uh, 30 years older than you almost. I'll be 50 this <laughs> year. I think you're going to live to see, I hope, you're a young man, that you'll live to see so many changes. I think 50 years from now, which I probably won't be here anymore, but 50 years from now, you're going to have a world that we're really going to have that the Baha'i faith will have made good, great strides and the world will have made great strides with it. So Absolutely. Look at the last 50 years and societal growth now is almost so exponential. So I, I'm, I'm in for a real kicker in the next 50 years. It's going to be a wonderful <clears throat> change, hopefully. Well, I see a tidal shift. And so what I see in my prediction is that the faith will grow much more quickly than anything you've ever seen, anything we can even imagine. Mm -hmm. What I see, and so what made me gifted as an entrepreneur is I could see a couple of years ahead. I, you know, some people are gifted that way. Vision, that was my gift more than anything else. Because I did a lot of things wrong. Well, I mean, I, we don't have all day, so I won't tell you everything I did wrong, but it's a long list. <laughs> but, but one thing I had was I could see ahead, and I really, really see that the faith is going to, because people are so hungry for it. You know, um, they are. God's, faith, God's faith is singular. This is something I'm having this conversation with a gentleman on Facebook, and he said, oh, well, they're all paths, and they're all good paths. And I said, yes, they are all good paths. But do you realize they're one path? They're not multiple. And God God is not multiple. His faith is not multiple. I said it's one path. And so today it's called Baha'i. It's not called Islam. It's not called Christianity. It's not called Judaism. They're beautiful reminders. They're memories of God's path back then. And they're beautiful and they will be eternally beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the truths that were taught during the Muslim period and the Jewish period and the Christian period remain just as true today. Mm -hmm. But the social laws and teachings are from the Baha'i faith. And the true living tree, which is really what this is, is, is the Baha'i tree. If we deny, uh, Baha'u'llah says in the Tablet of Akhmai, if you deny this beauty, you have denied all the messengers of the past and have shown pride towards God from all eternity to all, towards all eternity. He's very clear that you know we have to recognize Baha'u'llah. And the longer I'm a Baha'i, the more I realize why that's the case, that we have to. Yeah. And as a Baha'i, having said that, I love Christians. I have so many good Christian friends and, and I have so many good Muslim friends and, and Jewish friends and all faith. So it's not like, but I think it's to the benefit of everybody to recognize Baha'u'llah individually and collectively. And so I tell Absolutely. People, um, the Lord, uh, God is the, is the ultimate, uh, ultimate doctor and he prescribeth the remedy. You know, he seeth the ailment and prescribeth the remedy and Baha'u'llah is that remedy for this age. Yes. I agree. No arguments here. So that's why I'm so excited to be a Baha'i. I, I really think I've been blessed. You know, one thing you said to me is, I, how, you know, if I hadn't been born a Baha'i, I don't know if I'd have found it. I, I, I'm the only one in my family. Well, my, my wife's cousin has become a Baha'i, and I have another one of my wife's cousins who's in a, uh, a study group with me. But otherwise, the rest of my family is not, are not Baha'is. And so I, um, I'm so thankful that I've been given this blessing. I'm so thankful that I was given this lesson mm -hmm. in you know, the, the writings, you know, that I've had the chance to read Abdul-Baha's writings. I mean, that to me, I mean, 
my wife asked after two years of me being a Baha'i, she said, you know, have you read a Baha'i, any book that's not a Baha'i book recently? I'm like, she said, like in the last couple of years, I'm like, I thought about it. <laughs> no. So I, now I, I, I do try to read non-Baha'i books occasionally. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Um, I go right back to my Baha'i books again. You know, I, I, I have two children and I see uh, the effects or lack of effects on, on the faith. I love my children. They're beautiful children. But I think both my children would benefit from the faith immensely. You know, they're, they're great kids. Um, but they don't have it. You know, and, and I think one more than the other actually uh, would benefit. I have a boy and a girl. But I think I see this in generally in their generation that, you know, you, you really are fortunate. Um, so I, I, I would tell any, any young person, look at the faith. You know, look at the faith yeah. for yourself. I'm not going to force it down your throat. I'm happy. You don't have, you know, just don't listen to me. I'm an old guy. I get it. I'm probably senile. I'm 54. You know, that's <laughs> really old. And anyway, but the faith is so beautiful. Look at it for yourself. Yeah. If you don't Seriously, like it, you can always you can, check it you know, out. It's you go back, go back to playing video games, smoking pot, whatever you're doing. You can go right back to it if you don't like it, but try it. Mm. Um, it's so funny, you know, with the, the faith, what it does for you. I'm, I just read a beautiful book called Crossing the Line by Richard Abercrombie. I'm telling everybody to read it. I'm telling you too. And this guy was a 15-year-old terrible uh, juvenile delinquent, um, African-American in, in South Carolina. And um, I, I guess uh, I won't tell you the whole book, but it's, it's a, just a great story about him and his family. I'll just say that one of the characters, or one of the key characters is, is literally Joe Lewis's sister, who was a Baha'i. Oh. Oh wow! Okay, but it's uh, she's just one of many characters that uh, uh, that just literally jump off the page in that book. But you know, it's really great. This guy goes from being a 15-year-old juvenile delinquent, stealing and lying and uh, drugs and drinking and gambling. I mean, he did everything and, and playing hooky from school to a perfect child overnight. Uh, you know, the faith isn't going to do that for everybody, but it really does transform you. And, and I would say it's a living religion. What I mean by that, it's just not a tradition. This is not handed down, as you know, from parent to child. This is mm -hmm. something you had to find. You had to find. Um, I, I would say that just there's people close to me that are very material. And I see the stress. You know, I see the stress that they have to deal with. And I think about it, you know, and that, that's what I was saying to a couple of my Baha'i friends recently. I'm like, we're going into this war. It's COVID war. And I've got a shield and I've got a sword and I'm happy. And I'm like... But that person over there is going naked, and I feel hard. I feel horrible for them mm -hmm. because they're going into this really anxious, terrible time with with nothing. You know, what do I got? I got well. You know, the COVID virus might kill me, might kill my friends, might kill my family, and they're scared. And so I just try to share the faith a lot more now, and I just try to share the, the lessons of the faith, even if people don't want to become Baha'is. Look, we're one human family. Yeah, absolutely. Other. Even if you don't want to become a Baha'i, that unity as a Muslim or as a Christian or as a Jew is so important. What to you is the most important aspect of the faith? The most important aspect of the Baha'i faith is that this, two things, can I say two? That this is the faith for this age, period. That this is the age, this is the Baha'i era. And that this era is about the oneness, that, that we're one human family. So this is the promised thousand years of peace in the Bible. This is it. This is, this is, this is what the world's been waiting for, that it's so desperately waiting for. Mm -hmm. More than ever, we have it. Look at it. And if you don't like it, as Abdul Baha said, you know, if you don't like peace, you could always go back to war. But... And, if, and I always say to people, if you have a better idea on how to get the world to world peace than the Baha'i faith, then you should absolutely do it. Please and by the way, tell me about it so I can stop being a Baha'i and be whatever you are. Yeah. But no one's yeah. ever taken me up on that. So I, uh, I just think, you know, we got this. We have the secret to world peace, period. We literally as Baha'is have the secret to world peace. Absolutely. Um, come see it. If you don't like it, if you don't think we're right, well, you try Thank you so much for being on the show. That was wonderful. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the interview and really enjoyed learning about his journey into the Baha'i faith. Um, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. I wish you so much luck. And I really, my big, my big prayer and hope for you is that someday you are on this mountain uh, climbing up the stairs for yourself. It sounds like you've had such an interesting life. You really do have your, a lot to thank your grandparents for. Um, I really appreciate the kind words about the gate. And uh, 
your eyes on uh, what we're doing at Wayfair and Spring Green. We're going to come out with a movie about Tahare, we hope. We just hired a script writer. So yeah. uh, I'm not done yet. So look for our movies. Uh, have a great time. And where is this going to go, by the way? This will be on YouTube, of course, and uh, various Facebook and Instagram pages that I am a part of. Well, send me a link and I'll share it and I'll get you a few more followers. Oh, well, I would absolutely appreciate that. And you guys don't forget to like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff and have a beautiful day. Goodbye.